All right, again, welcome everyone to the April 2024 meeting of the Glendale Coin Club. Really appreciate everyone that came out tonight um, and everyone watching at home on YouTube. Uh, I guess we'll start out the meeting by a uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Governor Ben going to start us out. Did not bring the flag tonight for YouTube, so everybody has to look at their own flag. And then, uh, but we got the flag here in the room. I pledge of allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you for that. Uh, just a reminder in the meeting, Ben's over here selling raffle tickets. Don't be shy if you haven't gotten any, any of those yet. There's a bunch of junk silver up there available as prizes, and uh, some of it's kind of junky too. And then there's a, <laughs> there's a nice MS64 Morgan dollar as the top prize for tonight. Uh, he's also selling tickets for our 50-50 raffle. If you remember that, uh, half the money goes to the club to support things like our refreshments and other club expenses. And then half goes to the winner if you want to participate in that and if you're feeling lucky. So see Ben for that. Other announcements we have here is that Gordon, who's not able to be here tonight, I met up with him earlier in the week. And the first two rows of auction items up there, the first 10 lots in the auction tonight uh, are Gordon's. And he said half of all the proceeds from those are going to be going to the club. So when the first 10 items come up, thank you, Gordon. When those first 10 items come up, don't let uh, Don win anything too cheap or anything. Just remember half of it's going to the... YouTube can't see that. You have one question, though? I saw There's one. one. Oh, maybe two. Oh, two questions. Okay. Silver um, this yeah. week is not cheap. What's that? Silver this week is not cheap. All the lots will be starting at a dollar, those first 10 lots. So we'll see what happens. But... um. Yeah, silver has definitely gone up a little bit. Yeah, the, since the last meeting, uh, gold and silver has taken quite a jump there. I'm sure you guys have noticed that. It's uh, it's actually making it a little tougher to get prizes for the raffles because we don't know, you know. But um, we're going to keep trying to do it the way we do it. And if it goes up too much more, then we'll have to make maybe make adjustments. But uh, as long as you guys keep buying lots of raffle tickets and supporting it, we'll keep doing it, right? We have a case of Red Books supposed to be delivered any day now. Of course, they're not here yet. They told me early April, and it's getting to be mid-April. But um, we still have a sign-up sheet. If you haven't signed up to get a Red Book and you want to buy a Red Book through the club, they're twelve bucks each. We got a it's the spiral bound ones. They retail, I think, seventeen ninety five, and we got a few few available that aren't spoken for. If you want to go ahead and get in on that, just let me know. Uh, we just had our March Glendale Coin Club show at the Van Nuys Masonic Lodge. It was a sold-out show. We thought all the tables sold out. I thought the attendance was pretty good. It could always be better, of course. We had okay attendance by the club members as well. So thanks to all of you who did come out to the meeting to support or to the show to support the club and our dealers. Um, of course, we're gonna. You know, we always need more help at the show. And thank you to Andre and we had Lynn show up and help at the front desk and. Some others helping out the show, the Barry family, as always. Um, well, as always, until our next show, because they all, they're all moving to Alaska. So for this next show in October, we're probably going to need even a little bit more help from the club members. So uh, don't be shy and volunteer in either a little bit of time, either to help out with uh, the front table or maybe a little bit with setup in the morning. Probably don't need too much with setup in the morning. But the other issue is uh, the kitchen that we do at the show. It's always been Don and his family doing something there and if they're not there we might need someone to volunteer to maybe sell some water and some pops and whatever we in the years past it doesn't have to be too complicated either we don't have to be cooking anything or i mean we could order a few pizzas and just sell slices of pizza or the whole point is we need something there open for a couple hours during the show just so dealers have something so they don't feel pressured or pack up early and leave and so customers don't leave if they get thirsty or need a quick bite or anything so it's just something we do as a courtesy. And it never makes money. We always lose a hundred or two on the kitchen and it's fine. It's fine. It's just part of the deal, but we got to provide something there. So um, I'll be calling for volunteers or people to help with that because, I mean, I can help with a lot of it, but if I actually have a, sh a table at the show too, then it's a lot tougher. And even if I decide, hey, I'm not going to have a table at the show, it's hard to be at the front table and the kitchen and every it can only be one place at a time. <coughs> Anyway, keep that in mind. We got until October for that. But so far, we, everything's on schedule for our October 27th coin show. It's um, got most of the tables already 
pre-set up, you know, pre-sold uh, to all the people that were there last time. And, you know, we're going to get our advertising going pretty soon on that and postcards printed up and should be good. If anybody has any questions on that, definitely let me know. Um, one more thing that we haven't talked about in the last couple months is Greg Berkovitz donated this item right here to the club. It's the $1 large size note back in September. And a lot of us have been signing that. It's a short snorter project here for the Glendale Coin Club. So if you guys have not yet put your name on there, a lot of people put their signatures on there, but a lot of people just been, you know, printing their names too. So somebody five years, 10 years, 50 years from now will know what the heck it is. And most of us, most people would want to know what our signatures are. But if you have not yet put your name on there and you're a member of the club and you want to have your name on there, we'll have this up here or we'll put it over there somewhere up there during show and tell. And you guys can all jot your name on there and be part of it. So thanks, Greg, for keeping that tradition going and volunteering that. Um, what else do we have to make announcements for? National Coin Week is coming up. It's the 100th anniversary of National Coin Week, I read. It's uh, going to be April 21st through the 27th. Um, it's put on by the American Numismatic Association. There's lots of articles um, on their website, money.org. They're going to have several live web seminars during that week. I think they're all going through the Zoom platform. So if you want to watch any of those, I think you're going to have to be there then. I don't know if they're going to get recorded or not. Um, and I think you got to pre-register for them through their website. And I don't know if you have to be a member to do that or not. It'd be better if you were a member of the ANA, though. And I recommend everybody does become a member of the ANA. It's our National Coin Club. And during National Coin Week, I think they're offering $10 off your membership dues if you are a new member. So if you have questions on that, let me know on that. I can help you out with that. All right. Um, upcoming coin shows. I hear there's a coin show coming up here in Arcadia in a couple of weeks, in next weekend. Next weekend by the CSNA, California State Numismatic Association, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the 9th. 19th, 20th, and the 21st at the Cart Arcade Masonic Center. Make sure you guys go there and support them. Uh, ANAX is going to be there, it says. Educational programs, free coins for youth. And um, Phil, is there anything else that we need to say about that or any other comments or announcements on that one? There you go. Free parking, and it's a good location, and uh, hope you guys support it. Another show here. If you don't know where the Ar this Arcadia show is, maybe you know where this Arcadia show is, same spot. This one's coming up in May, the 18th through the 19th, and Arcadia Masonic Lodge. Mark down both dates, April 19th through the 21st, May 18th through 24th, and it looks like there's another one in the middle of October there for you guys if you want to check out that show as well. Um, other shows coming up... Uh, I guess the only other one I can think of offhand would be the Long Beach shows uh, first week of June, 6th through the 8th. All right. Anybody else have any other announcements or anything we need to go over? Any other? Uh, there's the Heartland show coming up on uh, May 11th. Heartland Coin Club show, May 11th. Yeah. Okay. And do you know, and that's in Heartland? Heartland. Perfect. Is that it's near San Diego. Yes. Okay. Anybody else have any other announcements? Nothing, huh? All right. Uh, ben, you ready for uh, to give away those two dimes, pick a raffle ticket, and then do the early bird? Do the early, early bird and then, sorry, the 50-50. Still plenty of time to buy raffle tickets, but we always give at least one prize out before the program. I encourage you to buy now or before now. And these will be your red tickets. If you want them. Of the two silver dimes. Six three five five one zero. Six three five five one zero. That no, wasn't me. Wasn't it? Was it Ben again? You oh, picking your own winner? Uh, no, it's not me. I was. Check those tickets. You got to be here. Six three five five one zero. Oh, 
I was talking about this last meeting. What? We, we, I don't know who else can be in here. <laughs> I don't think we should be in here. <laughs> well, if nobody's claiming it, you're going to pick another one. <laughs> I think we had right, we actually left three in there. We had three in there. Six, three, six, five, zero, zero. That sounds like this roll of tickets. No. Looks like John Duff. Very nice. Congratulations, Duff. And then uh, are you ready for a 50 50 drawing? Uh, well, I can't. Just got to tell us how much we brought in and who gets what. All right, $65. What is that? Are you getting your calculator for this one? Absolutely. Okay. All right, yeah, 3250. Winner gets 33. 33 to the winner, 32 for the club. Thanks, everyone, for buying the 50 50 tickets and supporting the club. Winner is 617 408. Close. Not even close. Clarence, congratulations. Very good. Very good. Oh, that's very generous. Don't have to do that, but awesome. Okay, we have a presentation. As long as there was no other announcements or any questions, we got a presentation tonight. Mr. John Duff will be presenting to us tonight on the ABW Club Tokens. And I believe before you get started with that, you wanted to yeah. make a quick announcement and, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my sister passed away in November, and so I've been grieving. It was unexpected, she had brain cancer. Within four months, she had two gone. So uh, I, I put together a, a, a jazz piece and a friend of mine up, up in Santa Rita heard me and put together a piano track for me. But, you know, we've also lost Jeff Klimzak, and we lost our friend from Florida online. Uh, yeah, Mikey. Archaeology uh -huh. Mike. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been it's been red. We got the terrible accident. You know, it's been kind of a hard year. Uh, so hopefully uh, me playing the song makes me feel better. And hopefully it's Thank you feel better too, I hope. So. All right, great. Uh, Don, you want to turn the lights off for me? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, take your time.
presentation up here and let's see if I can remember how to do this. <laughs> Screen. I'll get this going. Anyway, I'm, I'm from Imperial County, so this is a hometown presentation I'm giving you. This is a brothel token, by the way. They make uh, 25 50 and $1 tokens from 1933. And this is out of Mexico. Uh, and so the presentation really is wrapped around this particular token. I'll show you a few others, but this is the, the primary uh token from the ABW club, ABW club, ABW is a syndicate, not quite like Al Capone, but kind of on that lines. Um, and they sell this, beer. They sell beer. <laughs> well, there's prohibition. They sell, they, they, oh, they, they they sell girls, stuff. beer and gambling. They took yeah. your money. So, uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, I can try to figure it out. Oh, oh, there okay. we go. Okay, so the story really starts with a guy named Carl Carly Whittington. And this guy is right down the corner with the striped pants and the mustache. He was the king of vice of Bakersfield. Now, he was a pimp. And his father, Robert Worthington, uh, came out from uh, Pittsburgh in 1850 on the gold rush. And he was, you know, had gold fever. And he ended up making a ton of money, not by gold mining, but by supplying the gold miners out of Bakersfield. He had a wag wagon train and supplies and stuff. Mostly, I think it was the Kern River, if I remember correctly when I was reading about it. Uh, and he bought a ton of land in Bakersfield. And by 1890s, oil was discovered in Bakersfield. He became an extremely rich man. And his son became the king of ice. He had Bardellos to service all the oil guys. Because this was a big oil operation at the time. And uh, so he established a, uh, the Owl Saloon and Dance Parlor. And then he had about a dozen Bardellos. Uh, they owned enormous amounts of property, not only in Bakersfield, but in Los Angeles. And he was the king of ice. And there were other there were others there, but he was the big one. And so what was going on at the turn of the century? So we're talking about the late 1890s that this picture was taken and when he was at the top of his game. But by 1900, the temperance movement was coming in and uh, the temperance movement was going after prostitution, gambling, gaming, and alcohol. Those are the three things we're going after. By 1912, the first anti-prostitution red light district law was passed. This was in 1912. And of course, we know that uh, prohibition was 1918, I believe it was, or right in that time period. So Carly was a pretty smart guy, uh, a wealthy businessman. And he saw what was coming. So in 1911, he went down to Mexicali 
and met with a guy. Uh, change it one slide. Oh, I know. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Uh, and met with Esteban Cantu. Now, Esteban was a military uh, commander from Mexico on the winning side, and he was in charge of uh, Baja, the Baja area. There were some skirmishes that occurred during the revolution, but for the most part, it was peaceful. And he was very popular because he did keep the peace for the most part. And he is also the grandfather of a close friend of mine, Celeste Cantu. And Celeste was the director of housing authority that my mother worked for uh, in the 1980s and 90s uh, into the 2000s. Then she became, uh, now she's the representative for the uh, water quality in Sacramento for the San Diego area. She's, a, she's an expert on this subject. And, and, and uh, I was able to speak with her a lot about her grandfather and get a lot of the stories uh, from her directly. So he met, he met with Esteban. Esteban was, was the, the controlling uh, lieutenant colonel, I believe, and then he became mayor of Mexicali, and then he became governor of Baja California. And he was uh, Baja California governor until 1920. In 1911, he made a deal with Carly Whittington. Uh, Whittington would pay $8,000 a month for the rights of the red light district of, of Algodones, Mexicali, and Tijuana, pre Agua Caliente. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So, that $8,000 in 1911 was an enormous amount of money. And uh, this guy was smart enough. He just didn't become rich, he built hospitals, roads. Uh, uh, government buildings. He built the road from Mexicali to San Felipe and from Mexicali to through Ducati to, to Tijuana. And so very popular guy. Now the other thing that made him popular was 80%, the deal they made, 80% of all the employees in these organizations in the red light district were Mexican citizens. Good paying jobs, okay? That didn't exist a lot down in Mexico. And so this really heightened his popularity. And he remained popular during his whole time period until he was replaced in, in 1920. So that's a deal that was made. And, uh, this is a picture of the border during that time period. It wasn't a bunch of border check happening. There was no fences, there was nothing. It was pretty much open. Actually, it was pretty much open into the 1960s and 70s before it became a big political issue. Anyway, that's the board, what the border looked like in 1911. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, and you see Mexicali's on this side. So we're taking a picture from Mexicali into Calexico. This is the original owl that was set up. Now, of course, he had the owl saloon and dance parlor in Bakersfield, so he made the owl uh, the, the key thing. I think in Spanish it's called El Tocolote. I'm correct, any Spanish speakers in here? Um, what's that? What's that? Oh, okay. see. Uh, now, this was built in, uh, right after the deal was made. You can go ahead and change. Now, this is what it looked like. It looked like a huge barn. It was really big. It says the largest gambling house in the world, the Al Mexicali, Mexico. Uh, and you can see yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> okay. And pretty popular. Now, this included alcohol, gambling, and prostitution. It always was about that. It was never anything different. Uh, next slide. This shows a pan game. But I want to point out down on the corner, it says copyright Suckerman, Bro Suckerman Brothers, the Al Mexicali, Mexico. So if you turn the next slide, you'll see I had this, and I didn't know it was connected to this. I, I just happen to have 80 of the 126 Imperial County tokens that are listed, and this is one of them. And so now I know this is the Zuckerman, Zuckerman Brothers photography because obviously they were brought down there to take photos. Uh, so that was an interesting find, okay? Before that, nobody knew what this was. And in the, the early books on Imperial County, one is the first 30 years, which is 1903 to 1933. No listing whatsoever of these people. So um, this was a nice find for me. 
go on to the next. 1915 earthquake. There's the owl. That's what's left of it. Completely destroyed. So what happened at that point, um, Worthington contacted a guy that he used to do business with in, in, uh, in, in Bakersfield called Marvin Allen. He was out of Tennessee. Marvin was the expert on the distribution of alcohol. He knew he, he would, that, that was his thing. He was connected in that world of alcohol. And that's the A of the ABW, Allen. He also got a hold of a guy named um, uh, Frank Booz Buyer. This was the card shark. You'd think he'd be the booze guy. Right? He was the card shark. He was the gambler. He was the guy that became in charge of all the gambling in all of their facilities. They had facilities throughout Baja on the border. Okay. So if you turn to the next, you see that the guy in the next to the lady in the middle between the two ladies, that is Frank Booze Buyers. Now, Frank ended up living in San Ysidro. And he considers himself a philanthropist. For example, he, he built a good portion of the San Ysidro Library. So this guy was putting his money where his mouth is. Now, these guys were not East Coast mobsters, but they were vice entrepreneurs, and they knew who the mobsters were, and, and they had the connections. Uh, but remember, they were in Mexico. The, 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 mob, uh, the mobsters would love to come down and, and muscle in on their operation, but it, it was not an easy thing for them to do. And they never successfully did it for the, from the time of 1915 to 1935, when they were all booted out of Mexico. Okay, So this guy, uh, there are articles written up about him. Allen, Marvin Allen, who owned a, a lemon ranch in Calexico, right across the border from Mexicali. He did not want to be known. He didn't want to, I could not find a picture of this guy. And it said in the literature, he was a guy that did not want anybody to know who he was. This guy, on the other hand, wanted to know who he, who he was. And he, he was running the Tijuana operations uh, uh, for the most part. So next picture. This is what the border looks like. Now we're talking about late 20s into the 30s. Now we're talking about more of a border. Uh, and this time it's from Calexico looking into Mexico. And you see the tower back there. That's the ABW tower. Uh, can you see that tower? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the ABW tower. So next slide, you'll see the, there it is. That's the new ABW. And you see you've got now the owl on the top and then you have ABW club. Because now it's three owners. Okay. Mm -hmm. And much bigger. You can change it again. That's what it looked like at night. You can do it again. Now that's what it looks a lot, lot more organized. Uh, Mexicali Rose was was uh, 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 created uh, in this facility. They had a whole uh, a musical program going on during this time, and some famous people came to the club. There is an article during this time of Al Capone visiting the ABW in the Calexico newspaper. So it's, a, again, a very big operation. Again, this is one of the gambling chips from the owl. You keep going. Yeah, this is a picture of the menu, although it doesn't give the food stuff. It's just kind of the outside of it. I don't actually have the menu, but I was able to track down some photos of it. But again, the owl. Uh, the next is this is a matchbook matchbox from ABW. The next is that's the actual token. That's the token that I have. Uh, I've seen one other one. I've never seen the fifty or twenty-five percent one, but I, I know someone in the PCNS club that has more of these than I do because he's uh, got a bit more collection from Baja, California. Uh, it's a large, it's a rather large 38 millimeter copper. Jose Flores and Mike Miller were in 1933 were the last managers. And this is after Withington and Byers and, and Allen uh, had, had come and gone. And I'll, I'll explain to you how that happened. So it's 1933, two years before a new president came in in 1935 and said, all you guys, goodbye. 
And it was a very devastating thing to these border towns because of the jobs. There was enormous jobs involved and, and a lot of money coming in because of this, especially Agua Caliente in Tijuana, which was known as the French Riviera of the West uh, during that time period. God, I'm not reading you much at all, but <laughs> that's okay. Your next slide. Okay, so what happened? Uh, Carly Worthington died in 1925, uh, and these guys took over. Uh, James Crofton, Wirt Bowman, uh, the John Mills, the third guy, just a track manager, just a hired employee, and Baron Long. Baron Long was really the big guy. He owned uh, uh, hotels in Los Angeles and had the first big nightclub uh, uh, in Vernon outside of Los Angeles and away from the Los Angeles laws. And uh, Baron Long, I'll read a little bit of this, born in 1886 with a hotel, hotelier that was very successful, ran the first nightclub in Vernon outside of Los Angeles. The club was, club was popular with Fatty Arbuckle, Wallace Reed, Mary Pickford, D.W. Griffin, and other regulars. The club in 1915 was raided and shut down. In 1919, Baron Long bought San Diego's landmark hotel, The Grant, had interest in the Tijuana racetrack and the Sunset Inn, which was being run by Marvin Booz Buyers, I mean, Frank Booz uh, Buyers. Uh, but he, his, Baron Long, his plan was to build Agua Caliente and Agua Caliente racetrack that made them international. And you can see the racetrack behind them. The fourth Baron, okay, let me, uh, let me tell you about the other two real quickly. Uh, James Crofton, born in Centerville, Washington, uh, ended up working during the 1915 Panama Exposition as a spieler in the fairway show at the exposition. And he was quickly drawn to the vice in Tijuana. Uh, he would work for Barlam Bailey Circus until World War I and went to work for in San Francisco as a Navy shipyard uh, machinist. After the war, he returned to San Diego and went to work for Frank Booth Buyer at the Sunset Inn. I got a picture of that in a second. Work Bowman, he had the Mexican connections. He married, a, a, um, uh, he was from West Point, Mississippi, very handsome guy. He became uh, terminal superintendent of the Nogales, Arizona train station during the revolution which made it important because of the stuff coming back and forth for uh, uh, the war, the revolution. And he connected with the, the leaders in Mexico City. Uh, and that would serve him when they took over uh, the syndicate on the border. So that's that. Okay, next slide. This is the fourth border baron. He was... Uh, he would become governor of Calif uh, Baja California in 1923, two years, a uh, uh, three years after uh, um, Cantu left. And he may have the same deal, except he had the same deal with this, these new people, the, the, what's called the border barons. What they basically did, they set up a, a, a corporation called the Mexican Development Corporation and made Frank Booz Byers and Marvin Allen, part of that corporation, but quickly they took control. They became the controlling entities of all of the clubs from Algodonas to Tijuana. And their, their big operation was Agua Caliente. And again, Agua Caliente was the biggest that it was. It was finished in 1929. The, the racetrack was finished in 1929 and it lasted till 1935. In Agua Caliente, there was a famous restaurant run by a guy named Alex Cardini. He was uh, uh, he, he was very popular by a lot of people: Rudolph Valentino, Clark Gabriel, W. C. Fields, James Cagney. Uh, and his specialty was salads, and he and he would experiment with them. And he came up with this salad he mixed with Parmesan cheese, cobbled egg, garlic, olive oil lemon juice, anchovy paste, and seasoning poured over lettuce and croutons. He called it the aviator salad because he was an airman during the war. 
It was popular and renamed for his brother, Caesar. So they're saying in the book, in the book called uh, uh, Devil's Playground, they're saying that that's where Caesar's salad was designed. Uh, and it was an international place, so very possible it was. Okay. The racetrack. Oh, this is material from Agua Caliente showing how to get there. And this is, you know, they're obviously at our logo. Next one. This is a picture of the track, finished in 1929, closed down in 1935 by the new president at that time. Oh. Yeah. This is the ABW uh, that was opened up in 1926. The date up there says March 13, 1926. Uh, and it's written on the side there. So you see, they were still using the ABW even though Whittington was gone and the others were in control at that point. There's the, the article of Al Capone visiting the owl in Mexicali. Uh, the guy from Las Vegas, what's the guy's name, the mobster that started Las Vegas? Buzzy Siegel. He spent a lot of time in Agua Caliente learning about uh, the operation there before he went to Las Vegas and set up his operation. So he was there a lot. And it talks about a lot about it in this particular book about uh, the devil, it's called the Devil's Playground, about Agua Caliente and these different operations. Yeah. So there's three, uh, before Agua Caliente and Mexicali, there were three clubs that were controlled by ABW. The foreign club is this one. The next one is uh, the Monte Carlo and Sunset Inn. So this is right across the border in Mexicali. This would be in the 20s, uh, from the 1915 to the, to, to the 1929 when Agua Caliente sort of made them look less important, I guess. <laughs> and the last one, uh, the San Francisco Cafe and Trevoli Bar. So these were the big hot spots, and you can see the age of the cars there. So this is the teens, right, and the early 20s, uh, a little before Agua Caliente. So these, this is where to go in Mexico, and I mean in Tijuana, before Agua Caliente was set up. Now, I had written an article about this, and in the article, I implied that how could the owl of Mexicali not have a relationship to the Owl Cafe in El Centro across the border. It didn't make sense to me. They were named the same, the same logos and all this, but there was no information as to who this belonged to until I found some information on it. So if you, this is the Owl, it, this actually finally closed in, uh, I think it was 2012. Uh, it, but it had, become just a, another cafe, a bar, card playing, stuff like that. And of course, there were hints of prostitution with this all the way back during our time, the 60s and the 70s. And next. So this is an unlisted token from, I have 16 unlisted tokens from Imperial County. This is one of them. And this to me is the most interesting because it's a half a block away from my dad's business. Uh, the laundry and dry cleaning business he had. This, um, uh, well, it is what it is. <laughs> Next slide. So I told you I had a, my good friend, Celeste Cantu, the, the granddaughter of Esteban. She's an expert in water. And she was at the Arizona University doing a presentation on you know, the, the, the water situation in California and water, really the water situation of the Colorado River and how all the states are dealing with what's going on now with less water and more demand. So when she was there, they pulled this book out from their library, which is uh, a book about Esteban Cantu's building of the road from Mexicali to San Felipe and from Mexicali to Tijuana. And inside of this, she found a picture and she, she knew what she found. And she called me and said, ah, figured it out, figured it out. So I'll show you the slide. All roads lead to the Owl Cafe, Allen Byers Withington Properties. 
So now we know that they set this Owl Cafe up as part of their operation back in 1915. Okay, that's where it came from. So there's also an Owl amusement parlor in Westmoreland. And although we don't have the picture, we know that it's unlikely it was part of their on the other side of the border operation. I mean, you got to have a lot of money coming out of Mexico. You got to have somewhere to take it. You know, not to mention having an operation on the town, two towns within the county to get business to go there. So this answered the question. We now know it was an ABW syndicate. In Westmoreland, there was a, there there is no pictures of the of the place that existed there. But we have this, and it's a terrible picture, I know. But it says, uh, Owl Amusement Parlor, Westmoreland, good for five cents in trade. So that's from that operation, OK? Next picture. And in Calexico, we have this, Owl Ranch, a lemon ranch. <laughs> you got to clean your money somehow. You get, you get the point? This was the, the, the United States basis of operation. Now, I know buyers, there's more what he was doing in San Ysidro. I haven't really researched that, but I assume that there were probably businesses there because these guys were very, very wealthy. Okay? All right. And that's, that's my presentation. Right. And of course, the moral to the story is you can't legislate morality. It does not work. <laughs> you just move it somewhere else and change it around. Or you turn it into syndicates, mafias, gangs, and death. <laughs> That's what you turn it into with laws. <laughs> Thank you, John. Very nice. Right. Anybody have any questions for John? Or any? No? All right, very interesting. Thanks for sharing all that. My hometown. Yeah. From El Centro. Very good. All right, well, thanks again. That was great. And uh, yeah, if anybody else has any ideas for presentations in coming months or wants to do a presentation, definitely uh, see me. We always like to, uh, or see John on that. Uh, we always like to have club members share their interests and what they talk about. Do John do all? Of them? <laughs> what, do you, what do you got for next month, Duff? I mean, if they come with a musical introduction, then heck yeah, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I second also, that. Yeah. Remember also, if, if you do not want to be, if you want to do a presentation and you don't want it on YouTube, you can request. Yeah, absolutely. We'll find a month to put you in. So yep. you, so don't you be don't shy. Want to be on YouTube. And remember, you don't have to be an expert that writes articles about this stuff like John does. I mean, we've had people just get up and talk about how they started coin collecting or what, what it's a, you know, it could be pretty much anything. So with that said, let's get into our show and tell. And then after that, we'll do our break and we'll get into the auction wrap left for that. But show and tell. Um, those of you that signed up, we'll go through that. If you didn't sign up, we'll still have a chance to do show and tell right after. Uh, but Greg Berkovitz is first up. Wake up. Ben just ran away. What else going to have him give raffle tickets up to people that do show and tell? Okay. Uh, I'm the paper guy. And what I have tonight is it is, uh, there's a type of notes and they're called advertising notes. And they're handed out or tossed around or published. And they, they're basically advertising statements. Okay, and this happens to be for the American Zinc and Wire Company. And it tells you to keep this note, and it's for advertising zinc. But at the same time, this came out prior to 1929, and it was for to let people know the new size of the smaller currency. Prior to that, we had the large size U.S. currency. And when they decided to change to the smaller size currency, they had about a year's time to promote the changing of the currency. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, a lot of the people that had the advertising notes printed up 
these uh, small size and it shows the denominations and things like that. And it was used to familiarize the uh, folks, us, to, to get used to the new size of the small currency. And this was, like I said, so this was put out prior to 1929, probably about 1928. There you go. I like how it shows all the yeah, denominations on there, even those thousands and five thousands and yeah. ten thousands. Yeah. It's kind of fun. There you go. All right, Greg. Greg, you want to set that up there too? Appreciate it. And Greg, you want to set this up there too with a pen? And it remind, just a reminder, we got the club short snorter that Greg donated to the club. And a lot of us have already wrote, jotted our names on there, but plenty of room on both sides if you want to add your name to the list if you haven't done so already. Thank you. Next up, we have Phil Iverson with Show and Tell. Uh, last fall, my brother and I were afforded a great opportunity to go to Hawaii. So it's something that uh, we can't turn down. And uh, Mike knows Hawaii is beautiful, so we decided to go. And we flew to Kauai, which is the island to the northeast of Oahu. Uh, we flew 2,625 miles and landed in Lahui, and we stayed at uh, the Marriott Resort there for over, uh, over a week. We were able to play golf for four or five days. Uh, we had a very beautiful municipal court, course right along the ocean, and it was just fantastic. It puts most other courses to shame. And, uh, one day we drove up on the east side all the way up to Princeville and to the very end of the road because it doesn't go all the way around the island, so we drove all the way back. And then we drove uh, on the other, uh, other way, we drove west uh, and uh, went to Waimea and we stopped along the beach and we drove up Route 550. And along the way, here's a map of the island. Along the way, there's a nice little place called Waimea Canyon. It's basically known as the Grand Canyon of Hawaii. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. If anybody goes to Kauai, make sure you go and see this place. It's absolutely fabulous. It's just unbelievable. Hmm. So we pass that we, we uh, from uh, where we're staying in Lahui to the top of the Mountain where we went was 21 miles and took us an hour and a half. Going up the hill was winding curves. We were going maybe 15 miles an hour at the most in some places. We uh, passed to Wyoming Canyon up the very top to the scenic spot. Just before that, there was a uh, restaurant, so we stopped for lunch there because we were kind of hungry. So we had lunch in a nice little restaurant there, and next door they had a little museum. So we stopped the museum, and they had all kinds of neat, interesting artifacts there. And we spent probably half an hour looking around at all the different things that they had from recent to, to many, many years ago. We were getting ready to leave and we went by the front door and I said, uh oh, I gotta stop here. There's a machine I just put my pennies in and roll the handle, <laughs> get my squished pennies. I don't know if John had gone over to service at those machines or not, but uh, yeah. not much yet. So they had four different designs of uh, choose from, and I, I choose these two particular ones that I like the most. Uh, one of them was the hiker at Wyoming Canyon, and so I'm a hiker, and I just uh, love the place there, which was nice. The other one is a rooster. <laughs> People ask me why there's a rooster on there. Well, well they got roosters all over the <laughs> island, and the story goes that there was a ship coming over from Asia, and one. Uh, one day when they were getting getting close by, there was a big storm and threw all the all the all the all the chickens off the off the boat and they all landed in the, on the island. <laughs> and so they didn't decide uh, they they populated and populated and nothing they could do control so they just let them go all over the place. So if you go go to the islands, you'll find them on the golf course, you'll find them up in the mountains, you'll find them running around everywhere. Every parking lot you stop at, there's chickens. Just, just, just about. <laughs> Everywhere. So what other is your family on? They're on Maui. Oh, okay. It's yeah. the same there, too. <laughs> uh, a couple, Chickens couple, everywhere. Just a couple of neat items as a remembrance. And, uh... yeah. 
let me put it back here so I can set the focus so you can see those. Yeah, those that was are pretty cool. Very good. Thanks for sharing. Phil. Okay. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Scott. All right. Well, knowing that uh, John was going to talk about Baja, this is sort of indirectly related to that. Uh, these are a couple of Baja notes. Uh, down in Mexico, there's 33 states that issue notes, um, Baja being one of them. So what we have here is a 5 peso and a 10 peso. This is the 5. Does it just say Baja or does it have a city in Baja? Just Baja. Just Baja. Baja. Yeah, so these are... BC. Yes. So these are available all through. And this is the 10. These are getting tough to find. When are these from? Are they in the, the, the state of Baja. Like when? Like how long? Oh, uh, so 1914. Okay. So 110 years old. Oh. So it looks like revolutionary notes too. But... Yeah. The toughest state is Texcala. I only know of one note. I used to own it a long time ago. But uh, uh, it's just a little cartoning. But uh, that's a tough one. But these are getting tough to find. But anyway, five, five cool. peso, ten peso. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. Scott. Want to set those up there? So Thank you. And uh, next up is Nick. Hello. So I ordered some new coins, and uh, I'm going to start off with these are all um, British coins. And these are uh, a new dinosaur series they're doing. Oh, wow. So this is sort of uh, Diplo Diplodocus. Diplodocus, yes. Something like that? Yeah. Because they, these are dinosaurs that actually lived in, in the UK. Nice presentation they did. A long, long time ago. So they're similar, but not necessarily the same as some of the dinosaurs we're familiar with. So Stegosaurus. And... Uh, And this one is their Tyrannosaur. So there's uh, one more in the series they haven't sent me yet. Okay. And then they've also started a new Star Wars series. And uh, this time they're doing the ships. And so we're starting off with the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> nice. And finally, I have uh, a few new acquisitions for my U.S. collection. Uh, a couple of these that I bought. Uh, I'm trying to upgrade my Lincoln series. And so with this one, everything is at least a uh, three red brown or th three red, I think, actually. It's a 24D in... Uh, Four red brown. Five red brown. Five red brown. <laughs> and you got a bonus on it. <laughs> and this is, uh, I've been, I, I filled all the holes in my Mercury set, so I'm upgrading also in there. And uh, this is a 1924 Philadelphia in five full bands, uh, which is much better than the poor one that I found, I don't know how many decades ago. Wow. And uh, then uh, I recently had a birthday, and this was a gift from my uh, brothers and my dad. This is the, uh, the gold dollar from the Panama Pacific Exposition. Now it's more trouble focusing. Thank you. Very cool, Nick. Thanks for sharing. Sure. I see those dolphins on the back. Cool. Oh, I know. I love dolphins. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> Did anyone else have show and tell they want to share with us this month? 
sounds like uh, Dennis. Dennis will do it. We talked him into it. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm still gentle. Uh, I missed coming here last <laughs> month because I was on vacation in the Philippines. No excuse. Apology accepted. And, and so I, I brought in a couple of pieces of funny money. The first piece of funny money really is funny money. The second one is a thousand peso note, <laughs> and that's worth almost twenty dollars uh, because the peso was fifty-five to the dollar. And you wouldn't believe how many of these we we used. This one's interesting because it's plastic. The other notes they have are all still paper. What's interesting, they have coins of one, five, 10, and 20 pesos, and then the notes start at 50 pesos. But the old 20 pesos are still circulating that have been demonetized. And they're just rags, but people like them because they're easier to handle than a coin. Mm. And the coins we saw were probably 90% the five pesos. And you'd see an occasional one peso. Very few 20 pesos and almost no 10 pesos. So that was fun. And I, I did get some good news. I visited the local museum. I have a collection of uh, necessity notes and, and drill currency of World War II. And my wife said I had to donate them to the museum in town there. They don't give a damn about it. So I don't have to do that. And they're all good ones too. So oh, okay. that that's that's that was a good thing. But they want some other stuff like that. Thanks, Chris. Any other show and tell? All right. If that's gonna be it, then that pretty much wraps up the YouTube part of our meeting, except we do at the very end, we do a giveaway for those of you guys watching at home and those of you here if you've watched any time in the last month um, all you need to do is leave a comment after we end the live stream this becomes a video and if you leave a comment on it you have a chance to win so if you went to last month's march meeting and it watched it any time from the end of our meeting until now actually you could even still get in if you can get a comment in in the next minute or so before i pick up the comment picker this is an 1868 eight reals from mexico that was donated to the club by Dorian of uh, DNL Bullion, and we're going to give that away as soon as I can bring up the comment picker and pick a name. So you got about one minute to get a comment in, and then next month. So if you want to win, have a chance to win next month's prizes. Here's a couple of quarters that were donated to the club. There's a barber quarter from 1907, and then there's a Standing Liberty quarter, 1929. It looks like so. These will be the prizes that we'll give out next month by leaving a comment on this meeting once it becomes a video. So, all right. Those of you guys in the room, if you're not on your phones right now trying to leave a comment real quick, um, you guys can go ahead and start with the break and refreshments. Just know we're not going to end the live stream for another minute or two until I pick a winner here for this uh, Mexican coin. So, all right. Let me try to figure out how to bring up that link. It looks like I'm going to get the meeting information. And then... Try to find out where that was. <laughs> All right. And go to the March meeting. Get the link for it. And then I got a random comment picker. And I'll share it on the screen here. I'll try to with you guys once I find it. All right, let me bring up the random comment picker here. Let's go to share my screen, the window, entire screen. We'll just share the entire screen. We ain't got nothing to worry about here with everybody. So we're sharing that now. We'll go to the YouTube random comment picker. They're giving me ads. One entry per person. You want me to do a math problem and get the YouTube comments so you have up until right now to get in. 31 people have a chance to win. The winner of the Mexican 8 Real is Thomas Tion. Thomas T O A N says, Cool, thanks, Kittle and Alfred R. You are the winner. Congratulations, Thomas. I better write that down so I know who to mail this to when they claim it. And um, yeah, there it is. Thanks again to Dorian for donating that. Again, we'll see you guys uh, 
next month, May 10th, I believe, is our next meeting. Next time. So thanks again for watching, everybody. And um, thanks again for all your support of our coin club. Bye.